Good morning, everyone. It's 8 a.m. Pacific time, so we'll go ahead and get started. So I'd like to welcome everybody to today's RPS GLOMCON session on membranous lupus nephropathy. So it's a pleasure to participate today. And so I'm going to talk about membranous lupus nephritis. And lupus nephritis overall has a very high disease burden in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. Lupus nephritis affects about 50% of lupus patients, disproportionately affecting those of minority populations, including Hispanic and Black individuals. It typically presents as hematuria and proteinuria on your analysis or may present with acute kidney injury, frequently with concurrent nephritic or nephrotic syndrome. Over time, lupus flares can lead to chronic kidney disease and progressive neurocrine activity can result in end-stage kidney disease. And approximately 10% of patients with membranous lupus nephritis and up to about 30% for those that have a proliferative component will go on to end-stage kidney disease. And lupus nephritis could be one of the first manifestations of systemic lupus erythematosus and the patient may not already have a diagnosis of lupus. So it's important to keep on your radar. When you diagnose a kidney biopsy that has membranous nephropathy or a proliferative immune complex glomerulonephritis in a young woman with a positive ANA, consider lupus. And the SLE disease collaborating clinics has a point system for diagnosis of lupus where in a patient with a positive ANA, uh, 10 points of multiple systemic domains could give you a diagnosis of lupus. And if you look down to the renal domain, having membranous lupus nephritis is eight out of the 10 points with a proliferative lupus nephritis being 10 of 10 points. Um, so it, it is something definitely to keep on mind when you have a diagnosis of membranous or proliferative myelonephritis and a kidney biopsy. The classification of lupus nephritis is established by the International Society of Nephrology and Renal Pathology Society classification system. There are six classes. And the first is minimal mesangial lupus nephritis. So there is presence of mesangial immune deposits without evidence of proliferative activity. In mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis, class two disease, there is some mesangial hypercellularity without other proliferative changes or significant numbers of subepithelial immune deposits. Class three and class four are focal or diffuse lupus nephritis. These contain proliferative glomerular lesions, and um, we'll go into these next. And then membranous lupus nephritis has an appearance of membranous nephropathy on biopsy with some thickened glomerular capillary loops with corresponding uh, subepithelial IgG deposition within glomeruli. And membranous lupus nephritis can occur in concurrent with proliferative lupus nephritis, so either a class 3 or a class 4 disease. If they are greater than 50% subepithelial electron dense deposits along the glomerular capillary loop, it would be consistent with a concurrent membranous component in a patient with proliferative lupus nephritis. If there's less than 50%, we don't call a concurrent membranous component as you can have subepithelial immune deposition in the setting of a proliferative lupus nephritis, and having a proliferative component will result in four outcomes. Um, these are scored on a kidney biopsy by the NIH activity and chronicity indices, and the lesions include endocapillary hypercellularity. So here's a Jones silver stain of a glomerulus, and you can see the glomerular capillary loops are occluded by mononuclear cells or neutrophils, and neutrophils is actually a different component of endocapillary hypercellularity included in the activity or chronicity index. Fibronoid necrosis and crescent formation are two of the most destructive glomerular lesions. On a Jones-Silver stain, we can see disruption of the glomerular capillary tuft with extravasated fibrin and a cellular crescent. Fibrocellular crescents would also be considered as active glomerular lesions. Wire loops and hyaline thrombi are other evidence of activity. And wire loops within glomeruli, um, where we have these massively thickened glomerular basement membranes, are due to the presence of subendothelial immune deposits. You can also have um, hyaline thrombi that 
we typically see in crab globulin anemic glomerulonephritis uh, as well. And so overall, um, with activity, we have the endocapillary hypercellularity.